strike the count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Walk him up. Chris Taylor. What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads Live, presented by DodgerBlue.com, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined tonight by Scott Gearman, Blake Williams. Gentlemen, good to be with you. Uh, the Dodgers are not playing, but baseball playoffs are still happening. Uh, Scott, I'll start with you. Uh, maybe you're the wrong person to ask this question. Are we all rooting for the Rangers here? Is that what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. Like, we want to see, you know, Corey Seager, we really like the, you know, explosive bats they have out there with Texas, not Houston, but Texas. And, you know, big Jonah Heim fan, huge Jonah Heim fan. Okay, there we go, Blake. I didn't, We're just starting right off. Scotty picking against his Astros. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, I think Scott just didn't want to have some hate in the comments because we I'll all know get... he is a secret Astros fan here. But... I mean, I just have, you know, you, it's tough to argue with a lot of their player development, and that's just it. Can't really speak to 2017 or anything cheating related, you know, because we know all that sucks and that makes him suck. But, you know, Dusty Baker, man, just <laughs> Dusty leading the winner. Well, here's the plan for tonight. We're going to talk some quotes from Andrew Friedman, a couple things that he said in his press conference that I thought were notable. We're going to play those videos in here. And then we're going to get to a couple of videos we didn't get a chance to talk about last week, which were Freddie Freeman and Clayton Kershaw after the Dodgers were eliminated in the NLDS. Some interesting comments, some interesting, um, I don't know, energy, I guess you could say, in, in those two interviews, which I want to get our, our thoughts on. But Scott, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the floor here because you haven't been on with us since the Dodgers were eliminated. And I do think it's helpful kind of to evaluate a season in waves. You can have an evaluation kind of right before the NLDS begins. The Dodgers have finished a regular season. I think how we were feeling in that moment mattered. And then you can have a second evaluation right in the immediate aftermath of the NLDS, because I think that how we're feeling in that moment does matter as well. And then I think the third point is kind of, you know, whether it was for a couple of us a couple days later, for you maybe 10 days later, I'm curious how you're feeling given sort of the accumulation of those three moments and and evaluations of the Dodgers season. Okay, so, you know, on here and as much as I could have, you know, pumping up the, you know, gritty Dodgers, that, you know, comeback scenario, team that wasn't projected, you know, to do much, you know, even Blake, Bucket had Blake, had them down and out throughout most of the year. Uh, They battled, but, the tone for me uh, and the, you know, the issues that, you know, fans, everyone, all the speculation surrounding the team, all the things that eventually, you know, brought them down uh, was the main reason that brought them down. But it was the offense that was, you know, supposed to be able to, you know, carry a little bit of that weight. And it's because it was all they had to do is be average. And it was because it was such a, a letdown offensively and starts at the top. Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, that had such a letdown series. Uh, that it provided the like, you know pitching staff with no chance to even battle. And the fact that Mookie Betts' first at bat in game three was, you know, the first one he took without a, like being down, like I think multiple runs, that was such like a, a, a cold shower moment. Uh, and I, you know, last year sucked just because 111 wins, most in franchise history. We were all, you know, riding high, incredibly talented team. Like how can they lose? Yeah, but this one was because there was no pulse. It felt like there was no fight, and you could clearly see it. Air got sucked out of that entire clubhouse. So, you know, that this one hurt more than yeah. I think in uh, years past. Even like you know, big home runs. Clayton Kershaw has given up. Twenty nineteen was terrible. That one was rough. But I think this one, just from a pure, you know, how it looked, uh, without energy, without results. There was none. I had no going into, you know, back end of game two. It was like, they're not going to show up. Nobody has a spark. There's nothing in there. And then you watch other teams in the playoffs currently and anything that goes on offensively. You know, so you saw the Arizona Diamondbacks, a lot of life. Rangers, a lot of life. Astros, a lot of life. Everything. And don't get me started on Philadelphia. That, that they're a wagon. They're, it's yeah. just there was no there's no juice at all. So it's just where did that where did that go? So yeah. it's just been tough. It, and I've kind of, you know, pushed away. Haven't really watched much postseason ball besides the Phillies, but it's, I just, I can't get over it. It's going to take me a lot of time to figure that out. Like how'd that happen? How much uh, the energy piece I'm curious, and, I, and I'm not implying anything by asking this question, how much of it has to do with the top of the first inning Clayton Kershaw in game one? Cause it feels like we're only talking about a three game sample size. And in two of the three games before the Dodgers ever stepped into the batter's box, 
they were, you know, the first game was over. The second game, they're mm-hmm. down by three. I would have liked to have seen more, but I'm just curious how those two situations feel weird. Is that does that excuse hold any water for you in the conversation of the energy level of this team, Scott? I would say a little bit. I, I'm going to, you know, wrap with one thing, and I really want to hear Blake on this. But, you know, game one's a wash already. There, you know, you're asking the offense to do way too much. Let's just regroup for game two. But same thing. That game was close. It all it needed was a little bit of a start, and they just never had it. Like, how can that, you know, that much veteran veteran presence in that lineup, two top five MVP candidates at the top of your lineup, where is that starting? It this is like people want to go against Dave Roberts or whatever, sure. But you know, th- there was more last year than this. I think that because like n- nobody offensively showed up. Yeah. There was no life. There was nobody, you know, getting anything started. It's like they're it entirely flipped. Uh, it was, it was, it was appalling. Uh, yeah. yeah, man. Like there's a little bit of, you know, to that statement about game one. Sure. It's a wash, but game two, they had all the, you know, the opportunities in the world to flip that script, even it up, keep rolling from there. And it didn't even happen until the end of game three. Like then we were like, you know, they might have something going. And then Lance Lynn blew that up and it just, it just came too late. It never even got started. They were already in Cancun by the time that ever they ever even thought about fighting. Blake, we've got a super chat, which I'm going to get to. So, Jose, hang tight for like 10 seconds. We appreciate that. I want to get your thoughts on that, Blake, and I'll throw one more tidbit in here. Um, I kind of laugh that the Diamondbacks are in this series. I mean, they are down three to two as we as we are live talking about this in the series. But you could argue they've they've been the better team in this series. And for the Diamondbacks to have been making a real run in the NLCS. And again, arguably the better team, although, um, you know, Kimbrell aside, uh, I, to me that there's part of it, like how much, how much stock am I really going to put into a tournament in which the Arizona Diamondbacks are, are this close to the world series? Like I have that in the back of my mind and I'm not even going to caveat that with no disrespect to the Arizona Diamondbacks. We know what they did over 162 game sample. So with that in mind, with Scott's comments, take it wherever you want before we dive into sort of more specifics here. But Blake, give me your thoughts on on kind of the 10 day after uh, postmortem. I feel like there's so many ways I could go with this with how both of you set me up for this. But we've talked about this before and talked about it a lot. The postseason is random. You're going to get crazy results all the time. The postseason is not designed to decide who the best team each year is. It's designed to be the most fun, fun tournament. Yeah. Like. You're not going to get the real results of who the best team is because you just never get the best team winning. And the Diamondbacks right now are a good example of that. The Phillies getting hot last year is another good example of that. Even the 1988 Dodgers, when they won, they weren't the best team and no one thought they would win. Tommy Lasorda said no one gave them a chance and they still came out and won. They beat two teams who everyone thought was the favorites. So you can't look at the postseason in the context of the Dodgers aren't a good team because they didn't win in the postseason because it's just random at the end of the day. But at the same time, I also think there is something to them being down in two games before they even had a chance to score. Kershaw coming out was really deflating. Bobby Miller struggling was a bit more deflating because I think all of us had more hope for him. Yeah. And putting that pressure on the offense in important games in a small series, it's really tough to come back from. You get players start to press and you just put yourself in a really tough spot there. And then I do also think there's something to them not having as much energy. You kind of need that life in the postseason. Like the level heads will carry you throughout the regular season really well. It'll prevent you from going too high and too low in those ups and downs and peaking at wrong times because of it or not letting it like, you know, you have to stay level and kind of carry yourself yeah. through the season without going too up or too down. But in the postseason, it's it's a sprint instead of the marathon like they all talk about. So you need that energy. You need that excitement. And it's the same thing that kind of happened last year with the Dodgers. There is an NL scout who criticized the team saying they were boring. And we've kind of acknowledged that before. I, I don't know if boring is exactly the right term, but they didn't play with energy. And you need that energy. Like you look at the Phillies when they hit a home run and all their players are on the top of the dugout dancing and jumping up and down and screaming. And the Dodgers are just a bit more calm. So I think it's been a problem. It's probably somewhat related to having Dave Roberts, Freddie Freeman, and Mookie Betts there. They're all great. Dave is a great manager and Mookie and Freddie are great players, but they don't really bring that same energy that like a Bryce Harper type player is bringing. And I think you do need that in the postseason. So 
hopefully they can kind of find that edge. We were hoping Miguel Vargas or JD Martinez would help bring some of that spark. But as we know, Vargas didn't work out and JD struggled a bit too. And he's not that vocal leader either. Yeah. It, it does feel like, as you describe it like that, Blake, uh, first of all, I think those are some of the nicest things you've said about the Dodgers in a long time. So I appreciate those, that, those sentiments, but uh it does feel like there's a perfect storm of elements here. There's the randomness of the major league playoffs. There's the, you know, fluky blow up of Clayton Kershaw and Bobby Miller. There's the five day layoff in which if we're talking about energy and that being the biggest issue, you know, I'm not saying the five day layoff is the reason they lost, but if you're going to ask a reason why maybe the energy wasn't there, th that's a pretty, pretty good one for why that's a contributing factor. And so it's it just tough. Again, none of this is meant to like make us be like, oh, okay, that's it. Perfect. We can move on. And we're going to get to some Friedman quotes here in just a second, which he addresses that. And so um, I, I just think it's an interesting conversation because to your point, we watch 162 games of Dodger baseball. And then to hear people completely change their tone on this team after three games, I, I'm not saying that there's no weight should be placed in those three games, but it just feels like there's enough where you could say, oh, well, come on, Kershaw gets blown up. Really? Are we going to? So now we're down to a two game sample size. And then it's, well, Bobby Miller gets blown up and he was the only starting pitcher you really trusted. So now we're down to like a one and a half game sample size. And all of a sudden that feels like a recipe for making some mistakes. So let's get to the super chat. Jose, sorry to keep you waiting. Again, if you want to throw a super chat in there, we will get to those. And if we've got time at the end, we can get to some other questions. But Jose asks, I hope I don't sound too harsh on Clayton, but enough of everybody talking about him being important. His prime has gone. Time for time to move on from him. Scott, um, why don't we do this? I'm going to put this quote down. I'm going to show the Clayton Kershaw video clip that we've got queued up, and then we can have the Clayton Kershaw um, conversation here. So, Jose, thank you for this. We're going to jump straight to Kershaw. We'll skip some of our Andrew Friedman stuff to get to this. Here was Clayton Kershaw after the NLDS. This was a specific question that was asked to him about basically his plans for the offseason and whether this offseason is <laughs> Disappointing end? Does it make you? I guess how you've been approached the offseason first? Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, just obviously a horrible way to end it uh, personally, but that's ultimately not you know important. That's just how we, you know, how I didn't help the team win uh, the series. You know, and that's that's the most disappointing part, letting your guys down and things like that. So, um, process it however you best you can. I don't even know what that means really, but um, yeah, just go from there. I mean, you, you said over the last couple of years, it's always year, year to year for you. Um, at this point, you talk about processing it. Is there anything different about this offseason as you go into it compared to the, to the last two? I think so. Yeah, I'll just try to. Well, yeah, but I'm not going to. We'll see. I'm not sure. I don't know how to answer that right now. All right. So there are Kershaw's comments. Um, we'll bring Jose's comment back up on stage here, Scott, and I'll let you go first. Um, Kershaw acknowledges that this offseason is going to be a little bit different. Jose saying, hey, everyone's talking about how important he is. He's long past his prime. What are your thoughts on, on Clayton Kershaw? And we can get to kind of what happens next in just a moment. It's tough to watch. Yeah. Not about anybody else, but that's tough. That's really tough. I mean, but uh, it's it's something we've seen before. You know, Clayton Kershaw puts a lot of heart into baseball. He's, he's given everything to the Dodgers uh, for all of his postseason blunders. For all the times he's rode high, like MVP, Cy Young's, like he's always stood there, answered the questions. Um, are we too harsh on him? Like, are we, is that too harsh on it? But I mean, yeah, clearly his prime's over. He's at the back end of his career. He might be at the end of his career. Like we saw his, his shoulder injury was way worse than he probably ever let on. Dodgers ever said anything about. And to put as much pressure, like it was great. It was a nice story to say, yeah, Clayton Kershaw, one last ride, you know, get the start opening nod playoffs might be his last one go out there, but it's just tough. That's a really difficult position to put him in. Yeah. Uh, it, but I mean, move on from him. I think the ball's in his court. Everybody says that it's, if he feels like he wants to come back, I heard a great idea. Um, I think, you know, David Vasse said it on five seventy a couple, like a week last week, you know, if Kershaw wants to be back with the team and, but he still needs time, you know, why don't come back, you know, second half of next year. If it's a little bit like that, like, you know, give him whatever time he needs. I'm not, I'm not ready to just be like, yeah, forget him. Don't even think about bringing him back. How can you say that? Like yeah. if his health isn't there, fine, you know, let him decide his thing. They'll, they'll do that regardless. If he wants to leave, you know, everybody wants to go to the Rangers, go ahead. Like, but 
no, we're not too harsh on Clayton Kershaw. It's a, it's a tough start, but people need to remember like how much he's done, yeah. like what he's given this organization. That's where I'm at. It's just, I, I can't really be critical about him. It, it was a tough start. It sucked, but he's just a guy to stand up there, answer the questions. Um, and he can kind of do whatever he wants at this point. Blake, let me ask you the question this way. Um, I, I think there's, there's multiple pieces involved with Clayton Kershaw. There's the emotional piece of, look, there's not a single Dodger fan that doesn't adore this guy. And He's, you know, I think Laura said it in here. He is the Dodgers. Like he is, he is the face of the franchise. He's one of the greatest pitchers of all time. And he's done it perfectly as far as class and and from the upfront perspective. Um, I, I want to ask you, Blake, specifically about Clayton Kershaw, the pitcher. Uh, 2.46 ERA this season in 24 starts. Um, a 1.06 whip. He gave you 131 and two thirds innings. His career ERA went down this season um, to 2.48. Uh, what do you think of Clayton Kershaw, the pitcher? Forget the forget the person. Forget the the ties to the Dodgers. If I just told you the Dodgers bring back the player Clayton Kershaw, is that a good thing or a bad thing for the twenty twenty four Dodgers? If he's healthy, there's not many pitchers better than Clayton Kershaw. And I think it's as simple as that. We all know he wasn't pitching healthy at the end of the season. We talked about it a lot. The Dodgers talked about it a lot. But when the Dodgers talked about it, they downplayed it. And I think we all know that isn't the actual case of the what was happening. Yeah. So if Kershaw's coming back, I'm all for it. If he's healthy, that's great. He's probably going to be one of their best pitchers again. If he's not healthy, we might end up seeing the same thing we saw last year. So I think when Kershaw talks about this offseason being different, it's really just about can he get his arm healthy and be ready to pitch again? Because I don't think he's going to want to come back and pitch if he's dealing with his shoulder injury again. It's not something he wants to go through. He said that one of his last starts of the season, it might have been his actual last one, that pitching like that isn't fun. It's a challenge that he doesn't really enjoy. He'd rather just be throwing 96 than getting everyone out with ease. So the challenge of trying to pitch with a hurt shoulder, it's tough. But I think like we saw in the first half of the season, when he's healthy, he's still an ace. So maybe the Dodgers just do need to let him pitch in the second half, like Scott mentioned, or... They need to go get support for him, sign a Yamamoto or a Snell or Nola or two guys and just let Kershaw be a middle rotation starter who's going to give you top of the rotation upside if he's healthy. Yeah, well, and I want to push a little because you say when he's healthy, he's one of the best. Like knowing what you know about the health, this is a guy who's, you know, I think he's made 22, 22 and 24 starts in the last three seasons. He has ended multiple times, banged up. He's missed postseason starts at various times. And so without the caveat of if he's healthy, like just Clayton Kershaw, the guy who exists, the guy who will be theoretically available to sign and be ready for opening day. Would you, if you're the Dodgers, Blake, sign him knowing the the health risks that come with it? It depends on what they're doing with the luxury tax there. If they're willing to blow over the luxury tax, I have no problem giving Kershaw whatever he wants for one year. If they're going to try and stay below the luxury tax and be smarter about their spending, I think you have to have a real discussion about is this a player we want to invest in considering the health problems that we know are going to probably come up? Yeah. But we've also seen them take on those health risks like they did with Rich Hill, where it's just kind of, if you can be healthy when we need you, great. If you want to spend the entire season on the IL and then just pitch in October, like, sure, we just need yeah. you healthy for that specific time. Cause I think we all know the Dodgers are going to be fine in the regular season. It's just about getting that postseason push they need. So if they can have Kershaw just ready at that time, he's worth the investment. Yeah, and Scott, the other caveat, as I ask you this, is it's worth pointing out that um, he's probably the best pitcher who will be available on a one-year contract this season. And so, you know, it's like, well, if I have to choose between all these other guys, it's kind of like, okay, well, the Aaron Nolas of the world, they're probably going to want seven-year contracts or something like that. So the, the caveat with Kershaw on the one hand is, hey, this is a guy who's going to be available for one year, you know, 15 million, 20 million, whatever the number is. So I'll ask you, Scott, the same question knowing the health risks, knowing the history, taking apart all of your Dodger, take, to take off your, your Dodgers hat, your Clayton Kershaw jersey, you know, um, would you sign Clayton Kershaw if he wants to come back, if he wants to play and he wants to play for the Dodgers in 2024 and, and pick an, you know, $16 million, one-year contract, are you signing him? $16 million? Yeah, yeah, I mean, healthy. Like if he's, if I mean, he, I don't know what the if he comes be, in, but... it's got to be. That's that's it's all about that. If it because 
you know, projections on like spot track have him pushing like 30 something million. I yeah. mean, we clearly know that's not going to happen, but they just, that's just based off of numbers. Yeah. But if he Let's comes in, the same shows, number that he signed last year, which would think was 20 million, right? 20 million. So if he comes in, says he's healthy. We all, if that's all thing, like shoulders, okay. Like he comes in, shows up, says he's got enough juice left to, you know, give you whatever it is. And he'll be on like a Clayton Kershaw plan, keep him healthy. Um, sure. 16. If you tell me 16, that's an unreal deal. I don't know if he takes that, but I mean, if it's 20, yeah. I mean, I think they have to, if he's available, if he wants to come back, yeah, they need the arms. And if he's ready to go and and they're confident with it, I don't see any reason why not. Like he can give you quality. Um, it just matters that they need to be smarter about it. They need to, they need to protect him. Just like Blake yeah. said, you can't yeah. ask Clayton Kershaw to be a, a number one. It just, it's not, it's not courteous anymore. He's yeah. just not in that position. Like, it, it it's a lot like he used to he used to be able to bear that but his back gave out you know on and off the field like it's it's a lot to put on Clayton Kershaw franchise legend but peel all that away if he's available healthy one year deal yeah absolutely but everything matters is what they're going to do are they going to be aggressive you know in front office will they blow past the luxury tax or get close to it but they need to blow past it man to be able to protect him there to fill out this roster to be a like a to mirror the model that, you know, say the Phillies have two front end guys, they need to, you know, actually spend, they need to put like, ensure that he is not in another position to make that like a priority that he's, you know, the game one starter. Yeah. I mean, the good news is they have tons of money to spend, even if they were to stay under the luxury tax, Blake, I think you and I were sort of trying to crunch the numbers and we've got them at like $150 million in contract commitments. That's including arbitration numbers. And then the guys who are likely to be team options picked up that kind of thing. And so you're talking about quite a mini bit of money that they can spend. Um, the irony with Kershaw is that we talk about like building a, a, a roster for the regular season versus a roster for the postseason. If you, and this is the biggest caveat in the history of the world. If you set aside Clayton Kershaw's historical numbers in the postseason, like when they signed Rich Hill, I was like, that's a postseason move. He is a quality over quantity guy. He's not going to give you eight innings to start. He's not going to give you 30 starts a year. But when he's out there, it's always going to be very good. And that's kind of the motto with Clayton Kershaw. So if you want the Dodgers to build a team that's built for success in October, it maybe it's not specifically Clayton Kershaw because of his numbers, but it's the types of guys who are not going to help you win 110 regular season games necessarily because he's going to miss a bunch of starts and he's not going to give you depth in the, in the starts that he does pitch. But when you absolutely need to win, you're going to feel, in theory, better about Clayton Kershaw in, in a five-inning spot than you are, you know, Lance Lynn, like for the Lance Lynn types who will eat innings and and be very mid at best. And so um, it, it's an interesting debate. We've got a huge super chat here. So let's get to this one. Um, I am Donovan 73. Thank you so much for the super chat. He says, Dave Roberts is soft and this team is taking on the personality of the manager. If you don't have the players to bring the heat, it's the manager's responsibility to lead his team. Dave Roberts, abject failure in this recently. Um, Scott Blake and I, Scott, uh, Matt and I, we've all kind of discussed this um, previously. You have not gotten thoughts on this front. So give me your Dave Roberts kind of the, the re reacting to what Donovan said. Dave Roberts is soft and the team has taken on the personality of the manager. Um, he's failed to lead them to, to get the juice going as a manager. You complained, you sort of criticized the energy level that you saw. Do you, do you agree with Donovan that that is – primarily solely on the shoulders of Dave Roberts as manager? No, like it's not like it's, it's really not like it's, it's, it, there might be, there might be some, but it look at the teams that are in the postseason, guys. Like it's all there. If you watch in the games, you, you know, you see the players start this up. You see them rooting on each other, top step. Like when you're slumping, it's, an, and it's not there. Like you're not, you know, it, it matters guys like Dave Roberts allows professionals to be professionals. Like, I don't think Dave Roberts is a guy who's going to go up and get in a player's face and tell him, you know, whatever explicit you want. Like he's not going to tell you to be better. Like he'll, yeah. he'll, you know, go over there and speak to you like a grown up, like a, like a professional and, and do what he does there. But I think a lot comes from the players. Like and when it's yeah. in the postseason, they're the ones getting them on. Like you don't see the Philadelphia Phillies all, you know, somebody grounds out and they all go sit down. No, that doesn't work like that. You hit a hit a big homer, everybody's out there. You know, big spot, everybody's up, top step. Like it matters. Like that 
I've never seen a Dodgers team as deflated as it was. And there was yeah. no player trying to start that up, guys. I mean, the only thing I would say is it's easy to point to the Phillies who are hitting home runs and winning and saying, look how awesome their energy is. Because I would say the 2020 Dodgers managed by Dave Roberts, you could use all of the same language you just used to describe the Phillies, I think would have applied to that team. Like, look at Mookie Betts when he makes that catch against the wall and the emotion and the energy, you know, when the Dodgers are, are winning those big games, when Cody Bellinger hits the home run, like guys lose their minds. It's because they're winning. And Dave Roberts was the manager there, Blake. So it's like we criticize the Dodgers and say they're soft, no energy, and it's Dave Roberts' fault. But the same things we're, we were looking for now, we've seen in Dave Roberts' managed teams. I think that's – I'm not saying one side is right and the other is wrong, but I think that's where I hesitate. All of the things that people can be critical about the 2023 Dodgers for and saying, oh, these things are all Dave Roberts' fault. We've seen teams under Dave Roberts' leadership exhibit all of those characteristics that, that we're longing for in this group. Yeah, I think it's really just based on the roster and who's there. Like the 2020 Dodgers had Jock Peterson and Kike Hernandez. I know Kike came back this year, but he was more of a role player and didn't make as much of an impact. But those guys brought a lot of energy to the team. Jock was a postseason performer and was able to get guys hyped up. They had Cody Bellinger contributing, and he was another guy who came through that postseason and just energy guys there. So I think it's not all on Dave Roberts, even though I, I'm on record of saying I think they would have been better off making a change at manager just to get a new voice in the clubhouse. But I still think Dave is a good manager. So, yeah, they need to bring that energy and find a way to do it. I'm not sure if Rob, firing Roberts or keeping Roberts is going to change anything. It's really just on the players coming down to it. Yeah. And, like, if you look at the other teams, like, I don't think Rob Thompson with the Phillies is out there, like, yelling at all his players. I don't think yeah. Dusty Baker is that kind of manager either. And we see the success the Astros are having. So, like, how much blame are we really putting on the manager for not getting players hyped up enough? Like, it's yeah. a fair question to ask. So they need to find a way to get that energy and find some life to their team. But I'm really not sure it's on Dave or not on Dave. Like, we don't really know what he's actually saying in the clubhouse when the doors are closed and media is not allowed in or off the cameras. So I think Dave is a level-headed and relaxed manager, and he is, I guess you can use the word soft if you want to use that one. But at the end of the day, I, I don't actually think it's on the manager necessarily to hype up the players because they should be hyped up for the postseason and, yeah. and have energy and excited for it because they work all year to get to this point and then just to come out dead with no energy it's like what are you even doing what's the point of the regular season why'd you waste that all that time just to throw it away here yeah well let's this is a perfect transition we've got a couple quotes from andrew friedman that i want to play that i think i want to show because it will allow us to continue this conversation with more context so this first one from andrew friedman and then we've got a second one after but we can discuss in between Arrogance, uh, steadfast and convicted in the way of doing things. Uh, how how come you're not talking in terms of making significant change? Because organizational failure means it's on all of us, and we all have a hand in it. And if this were one person or a small collection of people, in my estimation. Um, then we would make changes. We just wouldn't do it to say, look, we made changes and try to cover up what has happened. Instead, we have a lot of extremely disappointed, angry people who are all gonna work really hard together to avoid being in this position next year. And so with the talent, with how much they care, with their work ethic, how much they care about these fans and doing everything we can to win a championship in 2024, felt like making a change would be for the sake of it instead of actually bringing better, more talented people in. All right. So I actually skipped the first clip where he talked about calling this organizational failure and saying that this was basically not on one person or three people or five people that he called this organizational failure. And so, Scott, I'll come to you first. There's two things that I think he says that are interesting there. The first is he calls it organizational failure. And the second, which we'll get to in a moment, is, hey, we're not going to just make a change for the sake of making a change, which I think is in reference primarily to Dave Roberts and whether or not he was going to, to get fired. So let's talk first, Scott, about organizational failure. I see some people in the comments 
saying, hey, there's no accountability here. This is just corporate speak from Andrew Friedman. Give me your thoughts on the idea that, that he, he stood up there and said, hey, this is organizational failure across the board. Is that a cop out? Not not being able to single out one particular thing. And if you spread the blame thin enough, then then there's not really anyone to point to. Or do you think there's some truth in that? I don't think. Andrew Friedman knows that nothing really good will come from, you know, just singling out a group like it was a there was it was a collective failure. If you watch the games, nobody performed well, but the bullpen like yeah. it was like a, it Which was is the one group that everybody hated for like 75 percent of the season. Without a doubt. Enough. Yeah, uh, it's it's he said it right there. I don't know whatever anybody wants to hear. Uh, he's, you know, he's a stand, he, he'll stand up for his group. But calling it a failure right at the top, I mean, yeah, that is corporate speak. But it was a failure. It's, it's that's as harsh as you're going to get, and that's a very clear indication that he even knows that they didn't they didn't do anything right with that. They didn't have their plan. They didn't have a setup for it. They weren't prepared, uh, you know, with their you know their staff who they went into it with, and their plan blew up before it could even get rolling. So, you know, time will tell that if they do come into next year with a you know a deeper roster more of a plan to keep guys healthy uh, and kind of get a better status report of, you know, the pulse of the staff and, you know, maybe that clubhouse, but I'm with Blake. I really want to say this real quick. I wouldn't have minded if they made a change at manager just because we've seen this story that, you know, there's been such a flop and they haven't been able to reach the NLCS with, you know, feeling juiced like they're ready to go in quite some time. Uh, and I think that's a failure. And for back-to-back NLDS exits, I think Friedman said the same thing last year, organizational failure. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a tough thing to hear again for the back-to-back year. But I would, I don't think singling out a group really will do much more than clearly saying it's all across the board. Nobody did yeah. their job. Laura with the super chat here. Laura, we appreciate it. She said, this is the standard end of every season press conference, which look, if you're standing up there and your team didn't win the world series, like this is probably what it's going to sound like in a lot of these, you know, obviously most of us aren't watching like the angels end of season general manager interview or whatever. Um, but it's probably a lot of this, but Blake, I'm curious, organizational failure. Andrew Friedman is saying, look, this is on our scouting department for not identifying the right guys for us to go out and sign. It's on our development for not having Miguel Vargas and Gavin Stone and whoever else not ready enough to contribute. This is on the coaching staff for not managing the emotions well enough. This is on the players for not hitting and pitching well enough. Like that's what I think, Blake, when I hear organizational failure. And to me, that feels like a better answer than the guys didn't just hit. Like like he could have easily just said, hey, if Mookie and Freddie didn't go one for 21 and Clayton Kershaw doesn't allow and Bobby Miller don't allow nine runs in two innings, then things are different. But instead. He said, hey, you know what? This is partly on me as the gen- the president you know, of baseball operations or whatever his role is. So I-, I don't know. I felt like he's getting criticized for what he said here when he's probably taking more responsibility. He's taking the appropriate level of responsibility, but he very easily could have taken less. Yeah, so I think Andrew Friedman is right. It was an organizational failure. And for all the reasons you mentioned, just no one performed. And to his credit, Friedman did also say, a lot of that responsibility falls on me as the leader for not having for having the organizational failure again. So I think all that's right, and it's good for them to acknowledge that it was a failure because we all know it was. And it's a bit of corporate speak, and it's just him saying things to say the things because you know he's not going to come out and just trash the hitters or whatever. But it's also the same thing he said last year, and that's where my problem is with it. If you have two years of organizational failures and you don't end up making changes specifically in regards to what went wrong and you just try and do the same thing for the third year in a row, then what are you accomplishing there? You're just doing the same thing. So he said, make a change just to make a change, but it's not doing that. You're making a change because your organization had a complete failure two years in a row. So at that point, you have to assess what's going wrong and fix those problems. If they don't know what those problems you have to, are, you have to bring in someone to find out who those problems are from the outside and help you address them. I mean, like even before the postseason started, we all said there's no way Lance Lynn should be pitching game three. And we argued that he shouldn't even be on the roster. So for them to go out and give him the ball in game three, like that's a decision that's on the front office and Dave Roberts. Yeah. It's something that went wrong. We talked about in the offseason, they kind of went cheap signing players. They went after Noah Syndergaard, J.D. Martinez, 
Miguel Rojas and David Peralta instead of going out and signing a big name when they were losing a big name. They didn't replace Corey Seager or Trey Turner after they left. They left the rotation relying on a lot of question marks and outliers. They had a lot of question marks and outliers in their lineup. So it is an organizational failure and they have to do something to address those. So if you make a change, it isn't just making a change to make a change. You're trying to fix those failures so they don't happen again. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree partly and I disagree partly. Like I see people saying, hey, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Okay, that definition is like in a situation where A plus B equals C. And if you keep, if A plus C doesn't equal B and you just keep doing A plus, like there are so many variables in the playoffs that you do not have control over that to just assume that because you failed in the World Series was because automatically you have failed to do the appropriate work ahead of time. That's just not how things work. So I kind of, to some degree, reject that premise. That said, to your point, hey, a year ago, they failed in the NLDS and they didn't do enough in the off season to go ahead and, and um, put themselves above reproach, I guess is the best way to put it. Because guess what? They put together a team that went out and won 100 games, which is really freaking impressive. And that's a really big deal that they won that. And yet, when you lose in the NLDS again, I think it's fair for people to look back and say, Hey, you trusted a lot of rookies, which was doing something different, by the way, was not just trying, not trying to block every young guy, but saying, Hey, let's inject some youth, some, some, you know, rookies into this situation, which was, you know, not, I'm not saying better or worse, but was different than anything they've done for the last few years, but they tried some things, those things didn't work. And so when you lose, I think it is fair to go back to Andrew Friedman and say, Hey, you could have done more last off season and, and messing around with the luxury tax. Like you did, you're telling us you didn't have to do it. And yet you did and sort of failed at it because of the Bauer thing. So I do think there's a lot of criticism that's fair on all things. I guess I, I, I just come back to the point of, I think what he said is, is kind of accurate. So let's get to then. And Blake, I'll just come back to you because this is the question I wanted to follow up. So he's saying, Hey, we're not going to fire Dave Roberts just because we're not going to just make change because we need to change something. It sounds like to me, he's saying we need to identify what the problem was before we make changes. So for you, it's the problem simply they weren't talented enough. Like, is that the thing that needs to change is they just need better players? Yes and no, because in 2022, I thought they were talented enough. And I think we all thought they were probably the favorites to win. I know the numbers certainly back that up. And we were very confident in that team, but they still didn't win. And they won one more game in the postseason than they won this year. So I'm not entirely sure it's based on the talent, but I also do think there was a lack of talent on this team and they had a lot of issues that they didn't address. They had the trade deadline and they had a chance to address some of those issues, but instead they got Lance Lynn and Ryan Yarbrough and TK Hernandez and Ahmed Rosario. So you can go back and say like, hey, you didn't do your job there. I think it's fair to point out they had a deal in place for Eduardo Rodriguez and they tried to address that and he vetoed it, which really isn't on them. But I think it's also partly on them that you didn't know he wouldn't accept that trade. Like you talk to the Rangers, yeah. you know, he has a veto. So say like, hey, can you go talk to him? Because if he doesn't want to accept that, then we have to have a fallback plan. They could have targeted Jordan Montgomery, who went fairly cheap to the Rangers, and he's pitching incredibly well. So, yeah, I do think there is something to the talent level. But also they had the talent last year. They had more than enough talent last year and still failed. So I'm not sure it's entirely on the talent. Yeah, and, and and I keep pointing out, like, I hate being the guy that feels like the defender. Dave Roberts won a World Series with the Dodgers a few years ago. So, like, it's not like we've never seen him be successful. He's gone to the World Series three times in the last seven years. So, like, to change, like, he was part of he was part of the successes. And so I, I, I find it hard to believe he's entirely, Scott, the reason for the failures also. No, but you know, the more we break it down and the more you kind of digest it, that uh, aside from 2020, you know, since 2018, they haven't, you know, sniffed the World Series. You know, it's, it's been 2019. I mean, but except for the year they won the World Series is sure. like the largest caveat in the history of the world. And Blake, don't come at me it, with the like, bubble stuff. It's a very outlier year, though. We have to look at it in that context. It's a very real World Series that they won playing under the rules. But also, it was a 60-game season to get there, and it was different. Like, you yeah, can't deny it wasn't a different format but, but for if the you, year. But I've said this before, like, and it's a, it's a complete defeater of your argument. 
you can't complain about him being a good regular season manager and a bad postseason manager and then discount the one postseason where he actually won by saying the regular season was too short. And I would argue till I'm blue in the face by saying that some of the challenges they faced in that postseason would have actually made things more difficult for a team like the Dodgers. They would have had home field advantage. They had no home field advantage. And so, like, I, I just, anyways, we, we, we've argued till we're blue in the face and circles and circles on that one. So I, I'm not trying to completely go down that one. I just think it's not fair to say, well, Dave Roberts, look, he's the, he's the common thread. They were talented and lost and not talented and lost, and Dave Roberts is the constant when you could easily just bump that back 24 months, and he has a World Series on his resume. That 2020 year could have been a positive outlier for Roberts, though. Like, maybe that level-headedness kind of helped them throughout that difficult year and proved to be more successful. I'm just saying that year's an outlier. We can argue okay. the reason, but it is an outlier regardless of how you look at it. But they went to the World Series in 17 and 19 also. So, like, what what's the what's the argument against Dave Roberts in those situations when, as we've said before, if not for the Astros cheating, he probably has another World Series on his resume. So, like, th- what, what's the what's the yeah, but to Dave Roberts in those two years? I mean, it's a fair point, and I've argued Dave Roberts is a good manager. I, let's say that the difference there is they had Corey Seager. I'm just joking there, everyone. But I mean. Dave Roberts is a good manager. I believe that he is. I just think this team needs a different voice with where they're at right now. Scott. I mean, I just, you know, just, you made me lose my train of thought. You know, you guys are blowing up on that argument, man. Just interrupted me. Uh, It's tough. Like it's for the stature of the Dodgers, like where they are, they are by all accounts. Everyone looks at them as, you know, the model organization of how to build from the ground up you know, inject money into your farm system, build it that way. And it's supposed to translate at the big league level. You're supposed to have perennial success and they do, they make the postseason, but they figured out an exact formula to win with, you know, subpar talent at the major league level. They did it this year. This year was the ultimate, you know, this was the year, this was the gritty year. This was the one where they figured out David Peralta, find him in a good spot, small sample. He's going to produce Jason Hayward, figure that out. They can win in the regular season, but, I'm still on the thing where it was such a letdown, man. Back-to-back years, DS, before that, CS, they just ran out of it. it I'm not saying that it, Dave Roberts should have been fired immediately, but something should have changed. Something could have changed, and I and I think that everybody's comfortable. And so for what, an would, or- what would you change? Because you're, you're both saying you wouldn't change managers. I'm not saying I wouldn't change them. I, I'm just saying if they did that, it's okay. If they didn't, then so you know, would you find change something managers? else. If you, if you were in charge, Scott, what would you do? If they're Everything confident, the if they are confident no, you, that there you, is someone you. out there, uh, hold on. If they are confident, the Dodgers, if the front office is confident, there is another manager out there. Then well, but do you think that manager's out there? Like, do you think that manager's out there? I, I don't know. How would I know? Like how? Like if they find someone that has the qualities that they would do that, then sure, fire Dave Roberts and then send a message to the rest of the organization that you know the d- division series and hundred wins isn't good enough. You can win 100 games and it's not impressive. They just got blown out multiple years in a row by so like inferior teams. Like everybody should be mad. You want me to get mad? I am pissed. Everybody should be mad that this Dodgers team has failed. It's ridiculous. Like you're the Los Angeles Dodgers. Like they are being laughed at. I'm laughing at them. Like there is nothing that they did right right now. I got so embarrassed during that game three. I couldn't imagine that this was the team. Like they look nothing like they are. You couldn't have sold me on the fact that there were two top five MVP candidates there. Mookie Betts sitting in the dugout looking with the most blank look on his face I've ever seen. That sucked. So yeah, send a message. It it needs to happen because they didn't do it with the pocketbook. They didn't do it with the you know the payroll. You could have done it and blown past that and paid the luxury tax because Steve Cohen did it. Why can't the Guggenheim group do it? Like this is just I'm tired of it. Like that sucked. Like I can't say it anything more than that. Like this off season for me is like a huge, huge bar. Like they have to blow past it. Otherwise, like, what are they doing? What are they doing? Like you can't, yeah. you can't keep doing this. And, and, and I'm not, look, I, I, I hated it. I had to come on and do the post game show after all those games. I'm sweating right now, man. Yeah. But, but, uh, but again, like this is where I come back to like emotional decisions are not the right decision 95% of the time. And so to just say, we're all pissed. Yes, we're all pissed. But that's what Andrew Friedman is saying. Just because you're pissed doesn't mean you just pick something out of a hat and say, well, let's fire the manager or let's trade Freddie Freeman or let's fire the gentleman. You know, like it's unless you identify what the actual problem is and, and root out that problem, you know, it's not like, oh, hey, 
you're sick. Well, cool. Let's chop off your arm and see if that helps. And, and 12 months from now, we'll know if it was the arm or if it was something else. Like they have to identify it. And this is why I think we sit here and we say, should they fire? Should they not fire? That's why I'm asking, like, what would you guys do if you would fire him? That's fine. I'm not going to sit here and tell you you're wrong, but like, who, who are we going to replace him with? And I, I'm with you. Like, obviously, none of us are in these meetings. We're not sitting interviewing candidates, but but we're also the people sitting up here saying, should they or should they not fire him? So if we're going to make an educated guess on should they fire him, we should be able to make an educated guess on who we would replace him with. So for me, like, I, that's the thing I keep coming back to. I don't have an answer for it, is I agree with Andrew Friedman. You don't just change something for the sake of change. You don't just chop off an arm and see if that's the problem that, that you've now solved the problem. You've got to diagnose. And, and that's the part I don't know. I don't know, Blake, what the diagnosis is for why this team failed in three games. And, and if we can be fair, the last two NLDSs have been very different. Like the Padres series, they lost the three games they lost by a total of five runs. Those were close games. They were on the losing end. They got their asses kicked in this series against the Diamondbacks. Uh, the outcomes are the exact same. We should be equally pissed about both of them. But I'm just saying, like, to just change something for the sake of change. I, I agree with Andrew Freeman. I just don't know, Blake, what needs to change. I mean, someone Fair. in the comments here threw out uh, Stan Cast, and he had all those division titles with the Braves and didn't win much. So there you go. Maybe there's your reason right there. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the non-baseball decision makers president. That's that's the issue. But yeah, for our perspective, it's hard to say what should change when we're not the ones in the meetings yeah. and we don't know exactly what's going on. But they do need to find what the problem is because we can't keep having these same discussions every year. If Dave Roberts isn't the problem, then find what the problem is and fix it. And that's yeah. what they need to make sure they do this offseason. And also, just real quick, I'll say I love that fire and passion Scott had there. Like That was the most fire we've had on a Dodgers related thing all year because the Dodgers definitely were not bringing that. Yeah. Laura says Dodger fans need to demand it. They're passive as the team. We have the highest attendance in the league. I think I, I don't, I wouldn't say Dodger fans are passive. Maybe that's because I host a show like this. And so we hear from people like you all who, you know, here we are at the end of October, the Dodger season's been over for 10 days and we got a couple hundred people watching a live show talking about the Dodgers. Um, so I, I don't think, I think the fans are, appropriately mad and yet also like unfortunately pretty powerless in these situations like we could be mad, as mad as they want as we want to and the Dodgers have shown by their decision making that sometimes they're going to make good decisions in spite of what the fans want and sometimes they're going to make bad decisions in spite of what fans want and so um I I agree with Laura that we have the best fans the, the highest attendance all of that stuff is amazing again I just it's hard for us on the outside to sit here and say Hey, here's the problem. Let's diagnose this and change this. So that, again, I'm not I'm, I'm not trying to disagree, Scott, with anything that you were saying. I am equally as pissed as you. I'm just 10 days removed listening to Andrew Friedman and saying, I agree with the premise of don't change for the sake of change. And I'm also agreeing and saying, but Andrew Friedman, you're the guy that's in the building. So I'm hopeful. You're the only person that we have any hope in being able to identify what the problem is and actually go and do something about it. Sure. Yeah. If and if the solution for Andrew Friedman and everyone else he consults with uh, is not firing Dave Roberts, and they clearly just didn't have the roster to yeah. you know field to you know to feel comfortable with where they were at, why not? Like, why not? You yeah. have the resources to do so. Like injuries in the in the front and like the starting rotation, sure. Uh, that unprecedented stuff. Like you were deep in there. Like Bobby Miller made what I think Blake like a like ten post or a triple A starts or something. Might have been less than that before he got called up. And people are calling for him to be the game one starter. That's deep in there. But I, I can't speak to what happened this year just because you know they won hundred games. Great. Like they performed. They put themselves and getting the buy is a good thing. Like yeah, it's just to be able to set your team up. It's where you like it to put yourself in the best position to line up your starting rotation and a depleted one at that, it was, they had five days to figure that out. And if their best plan was to start a Clayton Kershaw, that was not healthy. That's a problem. Yeah. So yeah, failure to that at the top. And if Dave Roberts isn't the answer to fire him, uh, then they need to show it. They need to spend and they have to, uh, highest attendance. I, I don't care. Like Dodger stadium is a spectacle. It's a, it's an attraction. Like, there's passionate fans there, but you're selling games out and you're, you have high attendance just because the stadium fills up a ton and it's a great thing to do. I want that money to be turned around and let's go put, you know, 
flex it. Go out and spend as much as you need to. Field a roster that you feel comfortable with. Be a powerhouse, and it's about time. Like you know, I don't say I don't say go New York Mets crazy, but you have a deep. You know, Padres you, you, crazy. You want Padres crazy? Yeah, hey man, they're in some deep trouble with their all of their financial stuff. So we can get into another conversation yeah. about that. But they have to. Like you yeah. had, if you're at a you're at a point where your farm system uh, needs a few years, like to to get back up there because some of their top guys kind of took a step back. You need to buffer that with actual, you know, otherworldly talent at the top end to give yeah. them some time to do that. So I think. If Friedman's not going to fire anybody, send a message to the rest of the organization. Then he has to send a message that they're willing to spend bringing that talent, give them a few years, and then they can go from there. That's just where it's at for me. We're, yeah. you know, we're paying enough. We're watching, <laughs> and we paid in we paid in pain. We've paid in post games coming on here and talking about that. And I'm, you know, lying to myself with about you know gritty Dodgers all year to come on here and watch fake grit all year to to have to do this, but something's got to change and yeah. I need to have Blake. I know we joke about it all the time that superstars up and down the lineup. You don't need to have that. You just need to have a team that's absolute like talented on the point, like on the level that you're the Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah. You're a powerhouse but, yeah. and field a team like that. And I think it's, it, they're going to get, when they lose, there's going to be crit criticism and, and a lot of it's fair. I, I think if I have to land the plane on this, we've got a couple odds and ends and we'll take some questions for me. Like it, it, when I circle back to what needs to change, the critique I had at the beginning of the season of the Dodgers is that they made seven or eight bets on long shots and, and they were basically banking on two or three coming home. So it was like, can we get a healthy Dustin May season? Can we get a healthy Tony Gonsolin season? Can we get a healthy Clayton Kershaw season? Can we, can Miguel Vargas pan out? Can Bobby Miller pan out? Can James Outman pan out? Can Gavin Stone pan out? Like you, you, you place those seven bets and you said, all right, we need like three of the seven to hit and we'll be fine. Well, guess what? Kershaw wasn't healthy. May wasn't healthy. Gonsolin wasn't healthy. Vargas didn't pan out. Like Gavin Stone didn't pan out. So it just, you go down the line. I think if, if that's the thing that I would change is take more sure things. If you're the Dodgers, take more guys that you can just pencil into the lineup and say, Hey, you know what? We might overpay for this guy, but at least we know he's going to be in there for 28 starts. And we know he's going to give us a three and a half ERA ish. And we'll be fine. Like he might not have the upside of a Bobby Miller, but we at least know what we're going to get. And, and I think that's the piece to me that I think organizationally the failure, I think the year before they placed those same bets and they hit Tyler Anderson panned out Andrew Heaney to some degree panned out Clayton Kershaw made it work, right? You had enough of these things kind of work themselves out that I think a year later, that was the organizational failure in my, in my opinion, but we'll see, we'll see. Cause the Dodgers will do something. I think we all expect them to go out and spend a bunch of money and where they spend it. I think will tell us a lot about where they saw the problems last year. Let's get to a couple odds and ends here real quick and get to some questions. We mentioned the Padres. There's a big story that came out today, which is that the San Francisco Giants have received permission to interview Bob Melvin. Uh, Scott, this is terrible news for me. I want Bob Melvin to be the manager of the Padres forever based on the season that we just had. And yet it feels like Farhan Zaidi is going to bail him out, which is terrible news in my estimation. Yeah. Right. Like it's uh, I would love because it's just Padres got so bad, like so it's bad. just so toxic, bad. Like, man. yeah, it, it was, a you know, just like you said, toxic environment felt like there was a new club, like a storyline coming out of that clubhouse all the time. It's a just, you know, to level with Bob Melvin. That's a tough clubhouse to manage. That's a lot of guys in there with a lot of, you know, different personalities um, playing for who knows what. You know, you've got Juan Soto playing for a contract next year. You know, Xander Bogarts comes in, huge money, huge money, huge money all over the place. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough thing for him to do, come in there. Guys, he hasn't been around. It's, what, one year? Uh, so, yeah, I'd love him to stay in there. But Farhan Zaidi has his time. He knows who he is. He's been there for a while. Um, they've got ties, I'm pretty sure, right? Right, Blake? Yes, yes. Yeah, oh, uh, Oakland okay. days. Perfect. Yep, okay. so that's why. And if he's got an opportunity there, what does that say to the Padres? You know, go yeah. give permission to go speak there. So uh, that's good. Sorry, news I got a little distracted yeah. there. Adolis that's Garcia okay. just hit a grand slam to, to put the Rangers up nine to two over the, uh, over the Houston Astros in the ninth inning. So you're great, expecting great me to, there. you're expecting me to cry right there. Aren't I know. You? I'm sorry, Scott. I, I didn't okay. want to break that to you midway through the answer. So I'm going to turn it to Blake here. and I'm going to give you a couple minutes to collect yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No worries. Blake. Bob Melvin to the Giants. Are you bummed out about the possibility of him not being the Padres manager two weeks after they said he was going to be the Padres manager again? 
Not necessarily. I'm not as focused on what other teams are kind of doing with their manager and coaching positions. I mean, it would have been funny to see the Padres keep them, but I'll go to the Giants and let them deal with it. So, yeah, I mean, let's just have the Dodgers be the team they should be. And I don't think it'll matter at the end of the day. Okay. The other bit of news was Clayton McCullough interviewing with the Guardians, apparently impressing in that interview process. Blake, is Clayton McCullough being gone? Is that the change that the Dodgers need to be successful in 2024? Yeah, I think we saw the answer right there. They need a better first base coach. It's been their problem for a few years now. I mean, it's not a change that's going to affect the Dodgers if he ends up going there too much. Like, good for Clayton McCullough. It'd be a good shot for him. We've seen other people leave the Dodgers organization and go manage somewhere else and hasn't really affected the Dodgers too much. So I know the guardians are still doing a lot of work in interviewing people, but yeah, he, it said he left a strong impression on their staff. So he could be going to Cleveland. Jeez. Chris Woodward just catching strays from Blake over here. Scotty just leaves and Blake doesn't even notice that he's gone. Yeah, that's tough. That's a tough <laughs> one, Blake. Uh, yeah, but Clay McCullough, he's a, Real asset. You he he puts a lot of work in. You've we've heard a lot of players speak, you know, really, you know, highly of Clayton McCullough. So he'd be a loss, um, uh, and but a huge plus for the Guardians. He's a really good dude. Uh, and I'm all for that. If there's an opportunity somewhere else, uh, to you know make a step up, I, I love it. Like that's that's that just from the coaching tree. I, I really like that a lot. Um, but he'll be a definite loss. But Clay McCullough is just can't speak enough like highly enough about him here. Uh, but. You know, it is what it is. They'll find another guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it's good for the Dodgers when these guys go um, in the sense of it helps them keep guys in house because those guys know that as long as they the longer they stick around with the Dodgers, they're going to have opportunities down the road. And yes, as much as we love the the first base coach, I, I don't think that's going to be the difference maker come uh, come postseason. But who knows when Gabe Kapler's coaching first base next year, Blake, maybe that. uh but he seems like the guy that's got enough fire to to get things going in the right direction. So who knows? Uh, let's get to some questions here to close out the night. Again, thank you to everybody that's joining us live on Facebook, live on YouTube. Um, we will keep putting out videos throughout the off season. Um, so be, be sure you're subscribed here to the YouTube channel. And if you're a podcast person, um, if you haven't already, please find us Dodger heads podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Google. We would love to have you follow us there. Subscribe. Thanks to all those that might be listening via that uh, that avenue to, tonight. Or I guess it wouldn't be tonight. It'd be tomorrow morning. So thank you for listening there as well. Um, let's get to some questions here. Um, here we go. Danielle asks, why do the Dodgers not seem to really go after the big names, always trying short-term high AAV and superstars won't sign those? There's obviously some exceptions. They went out and got Freddie Freeman, signed him for a lot of money. Trevor Bauer would fall into the category of, I guess, short-term high AAV, but superstar feels feels heavy for that one, but he was the highest paid pitcher at the time. Um, they trade for Mookie Betts, gave him the exception. So um, Blake, do you think this is, is as a fair thing that the Dodgers kind of avoid big names? It feels like they've been connected to linked to all these guys. They just have come up short. In some cases, they've actually made the biggest offer, I believe. I mean, I think there is kind of a mix here where they're specific about who they're willing to give big deals to. Like you said, they gave it to Mookie Betts. They gave it, to Freddie Freeman and just like looking at what other teams have done, giving out big contracts, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like for every yeah. Bryce Harper, you give a big contract to, there's also an Anthony Rendon. So, and I would even say that big contracts tend to fail more than they actually work out. But on the other hand, like you also get to situations where Patrick Corbin gets a big deal and he helps the nationals win a world series, but then he's also terrible for five years of the contract and, it just looks like a terrible deal. So it's kind of just like a mix of all of it. Like they're going to be aggressive. And if you can get a player to sign for a short term high AV deal, like that's great. Bryce Harper on a three year deal for 50 million a year. I don't think any of us would have been mad if yeah. they weren't willing to go 10 years on him. Like I'd rather see them give him a short term offer and say, like, maybe he'll sign, maybe like take a chance. Why not? Because then you get that player. But they're just really specific about who they're willing to go for. And I think the real question should be like, should they kind of change that approach on who they're willing to sign? But even if you go toward that, like Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman are really good players. And I don't think any of us are actually mad to have them on the team. But if you're just giving to everyone, like they could have Xander Bogarts, Anthony Rendon, and just a bunch of bad contracts on the book. So 
there's good and bad that comes with how they manage that. I guess it's the short way of putting this long answer. Yeah, they've kind of tried to go and get these guys via trade rather than signing them via free agency, i.e. when they went and got uh, Trey Turner via trade, they traded for Mookie Betts. Obviously, those are guys who would be shortly would be free agents, but that that seems more their preference. They'd rather trade prospects to acquire guys for a couple of years, um, even if it's arbitration years where they're going to get kind of market-ish value um, rather than having to sign them to the long deals. But again, Scott, they have made those offers. They've just come up short either because guys wanted more years and more money or they just didn't want to play for LA. So do you think Scott, that this off season will see a, a market shift in the Dodgers approach to free agency? I hope so. Like this is a, there's, this is a market that Shohei Otani's out there. Yamamoto it's guys who will command top dollar and, yeah. you know, length on their deal. And they, they're really not in a position to offer short-term stuff there. They'll get blown out of the water. Bryce Harper. I'm, that was that signing came really late. Like they offered him a hundred, like a hundred four year, 180 million, something like that. like 45 million AAV record breaking stuff at the time. Uh, and he was looking for, you know, longer deals. All these guys want the length, like they want the security. They want that, you know, pen to paper. They have, you know, because in that span, if they get hurt, you know, that, that little bit might is we're talking a hundred and hundred and twenty million dollar difference on Bryce Harper. And that's a, you know, an offer that I'm sure a lot of people would say, yeah, give Bryce Harper 10 years, 30 million a year. Why not? Uh, but this is a year that I think they do. I think that they understand that, you know, this is the market shift for the players. I don't know, or like necessarily about organizations. And we've seen, just like Blake said, we've seen him fail more times than not, but it feels like they target one specific to, to Blake's credit. He's been dialed in on this. He knows that they have like, a, they have a type, they have players that are, you know, pretty passive. They have a passive superstar thing, Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts. Uh, but I mean, and, they offered Harper like, like, so that's, but short term, short term. Short term, but Shohei Otani, I think that, you know, they got to break their mold, man. I think they need to. Yamamoto, same type of thing. I think they can get both, but they've got to yeah. pony up. They've got to go big de- big time stuff, and they need both, frankly. What they were there, you know, the top of the rotation's at, they need both. Uh, Jason asked, which veteran would you move to adjust clubhouse culture? Muncie, Kershaw, someone I'm missing. Uh, Scott, I'll come to you on this one first. Do you think, I mean, we just talked about changing something. Do you think... <laughs> sort of moving on uh, uh, the Justin Turner types who they moved on from last year, intentionally saying, Hey, Muncie or Kershaw or both that these guys were not going to bring them back because we want to mix things up. Do you think that's in the realm of possibilities? I think, uh, I, I don't know if they're doing it because like to change clubhouse voice, I think Clayton Kershaw is, you know, enough to, you know, he, if there's, clubhouse culture he's not going to get in the way of that yeah. uh i don't know if muncie's like, like i don't think either of those personalities are ones where you're just going to you know trade them or move them or not resign but i think max muncie's a very attractive trade piece for that yeah. you know 10 million dollars a year i think that's one that another team would really love uh but as far as clubhouse voice i don't think either of them i'd move for the sake of just like they need to go but i think max muncie trade piece interesting thoughts yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. I, I I agree with everything you said. I don't think either of these guys are clubhouse culture setters. Um, I think they they seem like guys that everyone likes, but but sort of are more go with the flow types. I mean, Kershaw just because he's Clayton Kershaw is probably going to have some sort of gravitational pull in a clubhouse. Yeah. But like you said, I I don't think he's getting up and saying, "Hey, you guys are getting too too fired up here. Let's calm down," or like vice versa. You know. So, um, but all that said. I think moving on from Max Muncie for a number of different reasons could make some sense just because where does he fit positionally? Obviously he could play third base, but the defense there not heading in the right direction. Do they want a full-time designated hitter um, in Max Muncie, especially if they go after an Otani? So I could see Muncie being moved, but I'm with you. I don't think it's a, a clubhouse culture thing. Blake, your thoughts on that? Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I think that's fair. I don't think either of them are like setting the culture. And I think part of it is I don't think they really have a guy setting the culture. And that's part of the problem here. It goes back to Dave Roberts there a bit. But I guess it's Jason Hayward is like their vocal leader. But he was a minor league signing on a one-year deal that was basically a platoon player. So how much impact are you getting there? Like, E.K. Hernandez is another clubhouse type setter guy. But you're just not getting that impact. And I think you need a star level player to help set the clubhouse because they're the guys who are out there every day making an impact. Yeah. Okay. Lewis wants to know free agent markets, not great. Cody Bellinger, 
Blake, you in on uh, Cody Bellinger reunion? I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to it if, but Otani and Yamamoto should be their top two like targets no matter what. And if Bellinger wants to sign on a little bit of a discount, like sure, bring them back, move Outman to left field, and you have a great outfield there. Well, I'm curious, real quick, Outman's defense. Um, like, what, what, give me your postseason thoughts on because it feels like. To, to pay a guy to be a really good defensive center fielder when you've already got Outman, who I really am high on his defense, it feels like sort of marginal gains. Obviously, you get that defense in Outman in left field, but it's far less valuable there than it would be in center. I mean, they need a left fielder either way. So, like, if you can just put Cody in center and Outman in left, I think that's just ideal, especially defensively. And Cody showed he's kind of back offensively, and Outman's great offensively, so... I mean, it's a good combo out there. I'd have to dig in. I think the underlying metrics on Bellinger were like really bad. Like he way outperformed all of that stuff. I'd have to go back and dig. So don't fully quote me on that. But I feel like that came up in a conversation. Blake will do some digging for us here. Um, <laughs> Scott, are you in on uh, on Cody Bellinger? Um, sure. I don't really like. I don't have strong feelings about him. Like I. Like Not I'm, a great postseason record. Has the biggest hit probably in my lifetime in Dodgers postseason. But for a 76 playoff. weighted runs created plus guy in uh, in in the postseason. I mean, it says a lot. It says a lot to him leaving the organization. Uh, but there's a whole another story there. I'm not putting a lot in, into that whole thing. You know, the stuff with Boris, uh, Cody Bellinger, and the Dodgers. That's a whole can of worms that it, we do not have time. I don't have the mental space to you know unpack that. But. Uh, for him to leave, kind of figure it out a lot. Like guys, like we saw Cody Bellinger, like it's stung. It's like to see that we were, were, was anybody really surprised? Like for him to find it, he's a streaky oh, guy. <laughs> you were, you were surprised oh, yeah. like oh, big yeah. time. Was he was awful for the last two years. Like I'm saying like the peak of his success, like to see how good he could get. Was that surprising? It was surprising that he put it together as much over the full season as he did. And Blake, I just pulled up his savant. I'm sure I, you're looking at the I, same thing as me. So go for it. I, I'm I'm out on Cody Bellinger after looking at this. Like his uh, slugging was a hundred points higher than his expected slugging. His hard hit rate was in the tenth percentile. His average exit velo was in the twenty second percentile. His barrel rate was in the twenty seventh percentile. So yeah, but he cut his strikeout rate a lot. So uh, good for him there. Yeah, eighty yeah, seventh percentile strikeout rate. That was the number that surprised me the most. Go ahead. Yeah, Scott. yeah, I really would like. I, I just I wouldn't give him the bag, and that's what it's going to require. Like Boris will do it. Some team will do it. And watch the Cubs. Yeah. Watch the Cubs actually make that thing. But I'm not like unless it's like a Kike Hernandez type thing for someone to leave, like to get non tendered and then come back to get a lot of money. Uh, I would rather just happen in L.A. I, I'm I'm good on that. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I would have loved if he had had that season for the Dodgers, yeah. but I would have been so pissed if they had signed, gave him the qualifying All offer that, or whatever, yeah. um, just because of how bad it had been for the past couple of years. And I like Cody, so I'm glad. Again, his home run in Game Seven of the NLCS in 2020 is the single biggest hit of my lifetime. Like, it is the single biggest moment of that entire World Series run. Almost so, crashed my car. Yeah, I yep. like so. Uh, Bellinger's forever like he's on he's up here he's up here somewhere forever forever him and Seager like it doesn't matter past present that you're forever Seager's holding the World Series trophy somewhere up there we've got Cody but Cody Bellinger's on the he's hiding in the back but he's he's top level up there boys so uh big big real, Cody Bellinger the person guy the real outfielder we should want back is Jock Peterson he's more of a DH now but man. let him play yeah. left field and mash in the let him cook season. yeah man I'm in yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, okay, so Lair and Jock one here. Nola or Snell? Short, just immediate gut reaction here. Uh, I'd go Nola for a lot of reasons, and I'll leave it at that. Blake, I'd go Nola, but I wouldn't want to sign either of them. Okay, Scott. Snell, just because it would be a lot of fun. Like just because his stuff looks so good, and I want to be different right now, but I, I don't Scott know. Scott picking I... Snell is like the most on brand yes, thing ever. So, f I mean, yeah, I guess. Uh, but it's just it would be, be really funny. Like, uh, like I just want to see what they could do with that because it's just it's hilarious that he can go three zero and then just power stuff right by you. But I'm I don't really want to give him to anybody. I've got my sights straight on Yamamoto, and I think they need yeah. they need to outbid anybody. But Snell just for the laughs. Uh, but neither, if you really want me to answer. Okay, last question here. JJ, 
Are the Dodgers counting on Bueller to be the ace next year? I would say the answer to that is no. But otherwise, who would it be? So uh, who? I'll ask it this way. Of the guys who are under contract ah. in 2024, who do you trust the most? Oh, my God. Scott, you uh, go first. Me go, no, Blake Bobby go first. Miller? Blake go first. Is it Ryan Pepio? I'm living in a world where Yamamoto is already a Dodger. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, you don't man. get to make up worlds here, Blake. Okay. Guys who are uh, currently, so you got Bueller, you've got Gonsolin, theoretically, would be back in time. Dustin May will not. But Gonsolin, Bueller, Bobby Miller, Ryan Pepio. Uh, am I missing anybody? I'll say Bobby. Under contract? Bobby. Okay. Scott's yeah. going Bobby. Blake? I'll say Pepio. We saw the there break we go. this year already. Pep, that Pep strikeout to walk rate was just great. He he looked like he figured Love it all Pep. out, but apparently the Dodgers don't think he's very good because they don't <sighs> want to use him in the postseason. Stop, man. I'm just no. Uh, I can't. Okay, I uh, I'll go. I'll go Bueller. Why not? Guy was almost back for the postseason. He's Walker Bueller. The velo's ticking up. So give me Walker Bueller as as, and that's a low bar. I'll, I'll caveat that with it's a low bar man. because I don't think any of those guys we mentioned are all stars. So. We're not I'm, not, I'm not saying Walker Bueller is going to be in the Cy Young race. I just think they have a handful of guys who will be above average pitchers next year. And, and I'll take Walker Bueller of the bunch. Although I probably, yeah, Miller versus Pepio. That, that'll that be an interesting video down, down sometime later this winter is uh, how, how we feel about those two guys is, uh, oh, Ryan Yarbrough. Sorry. Apologies to Ryan Yarbrough. Anybody want to change your answer? Yarbrough, one more year of arbitration. Scott, Blake, yeah, Blake, <laughs> Blake, Blake, uh, Blake's that, the biggest Yarbrough guy I know. So, that big uh, opening day start, the Yarbs. Apologies, apologies. Vicente Padilla Yarbrough. got an opening day start, so like, why not Yarbrough? Oh, Vicente like, what was a nice. King. Ephus pitch, Ephus what pitch a, was beautiful, king, bro. All right, everybody. Hey, we appreciate you joining us. As always, uh, the plan is to be here every Sunday night at seven ten p.m. throughout the off season. Uh, I'm sure there might be a week or two where we may have to take a break, but the plan for penciling it in from here on out, and then we'll have videos out Monday, Wednesday, Friday for the next few weeks, and then probably Tuesdays and Thursdays after that. So make sure you subscribe. Again, we appreciate all those joining us. We appreciate the super chats as well. That is Scott. That is Blake. I am Jeff. Enjoy the rest of your night, folks. And as always, go Dodgers. <laughs>